see one to check out. Then follow the life of Elizabeth II through her triumphant Diamond Jubilee year, our queen, the latest Stephen Fry Gadget Man. Wayne Swan, thank you for your time tonight. It's always a great pleasure, Brian, and good evening. And Joe Hockey, thank you for your time. Yeah, good to see you, Brian. We've got a $12 billion shortfall in the budget. Well, Wayne Swan, how did this happen? Oh, where to start? Right. Hang on a minute, Joe, hang on. The question was from me, son. Just let me answer it. Um, Brian, uh, we came through the GFC in very good order, but there are some problems associated with that, and one of them is the effect it had on our currency. That knocks the terms of trade around a fair bit, and reduces the government's take in terms of both direct and indirect taxation. So, Joe Hockey, what would you have done? Well, we'd have prevented this from happening. How? With a preventer. Well, I suppose it's easier if you've got a preventer. Yeah, simplest thing in the world. You just point the preventer at the problem, Brian, and turn it on. You haven't got a preventer. Yes, we have. Where is it? In the shed. Wayne Swan, we're obviously going to have to see some uh, cuts to government spending. Well, we are, Brian, and we've admitted that, and we've outlined what they are, and we're going to still deliver those excellent policies of ours in health and education and welfare. OK, Joe Hockey, what would you do in the government's position? Well, we would have prevented this from happening. We'd have got the preventer out months and months ago. Yeah, but let's just say that you do get in uh, into government in September and you can't prevent it. Well, we'd have to cut government spending. They've given us no choice. They're spending money they haven't got. And how do you propose to cut government spending, Joe? By increasing it. Oh, good. I look forward to that. Shut up. Gentlemen, is anyone going well? Oh, the underlying fundamentals in the economy are still very strong, Brian. Lots of sectors are going well. Mining's going well. Look at that. We've got the biggest mining booming in our history. But it's a finite resource, isn't it? No, it's metallic, I think, isn't it, Wayne? Well, how well is uh, mining going? Well, Gina Reinhardt, Brian, has got $18 billion. Yeah, BHP had a declared annual profit of $15 billion last year. Well, you could get some money from them, couldn't you, to help with this uh, budget deficit? Get money from the rich? Yes, money from the rich. Money from the rich? Well, we've provided the telephony, the infrastructure, the railways, the services. Why not? Yeah, but get them to pay for it, you're saying, Brian? Yes, the rich. Get money from the rich, Brian? Yeah. Never been done before, Brian. Or reverse the course of Australian history. How would you sell that to the Australian public? Yeah, you couldn't. Well, wouldn't you just impose a mining tax? Yeah, but as well, how would you sell that to the 23 million Australians who'd benefit from it? Couldn't be done. We wouldn't try. You think there'd be problems there, do you, Joe Hockey? Oh, huge problems, Brian. Well, couldn't you just get your preventer out again? Oh, the preventer's at the cleaners, Brian. Some problem with the diff. Oh, the preventer's broken again, Joe. Shut up. Tonight, the opposition unveils its workplace policy. In essence, we will retain and improve the Fair Work Act. We will retain and improve the Fair Work Act. Australia bestows its first battle honour to a battalion since Vietnam. The Courant, among eight ecosystems, placed on a global watch list. And a new study into the health of people with schizophrenia. Good evening, Anita Savage with ABC News. The Coalition has unveiled its long-awaited industrial relations policy, declaring workers have nothing to fear. Instead of work choices, Tony Abbott is proposing relatively minor changes to the current system. Business is unhappy, but so too are the unions. Chief political correspondent Mark Simkin reports from Canberra. This is what a small target looks like. Work choices might be dead, buried and cremated, but the coalition doesn't want to be haunted by it. What this policy promises are sensible, careful, prudent, collegial changes to a system. The changes include a broader range of things employers and employees can negotiate on, a restored building industry watchdog, and the need for what the coalition calls genuine negotiations before workers can strike. In essence, we will retain and improve the Fair Work Act. To prove his workplace credentials, Tony Abbott's been a butcher, a baker and a candlestick maker. His IR policy offers more for big business than small, though. Unions are the target. The coalition's proposing restrictions on union officials' access to work sites, more oversight of unions and tougher penalties for union corruption. 
the only people with anything to worry about from this policy are dodgy union officials and their supporters. Perhaps, but Labor still wasted no time digging up the corpse of work choices. I will do everything in my power to make sure that we never see work choices come back. It's here, in black and white, that he has put individual flexibility agreements back at the very heart of his industrial relations policy. I mean, they are AWAs by any other name. Tony Abbott does want to expand Labor's individual agreements, but he's ruled out reintroducing AWAs. The policy also resists tinkering with unfair dismissal laws and penalty rates despite the urgings of business. Despite some positives, the Coalition's industrial relations policy is too cautious, too modest. There are members of Tony Abbott's backbench.